Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Right Opinion, the home of a twat with too much free time. And today I've decided to cover a topic that I've always wanted to, and I feel that time is now, because chances are, when this video comes out, I'll be away on holiday, and won't have the chance to cover any topics that are necessarily trending. But I have to say, out of all the people I've covered on this channel, I think there are a few people more intriguing than the person I've decided to cover today. And that person is Matt Hoss. And if you're wondering who he is, well, you shouldn't be. But he is infamous amongst the internet community for suing Ethan and Ella Klein, aka H3 H3 Productions, over a reaction video they made on their second channel, known as the Big, the Bold, the Beautiful, in which they delivered their signature reaction style commentary. When I was a very small commentator, I made a little video called Matt Hoss Could Win, in which I expressed my feelings on the whole lawsuit and how, in fact, he could be successful. At the time, fair use was still a very untested concept, and there have been cases in the past where creators had lost against claimants. So I was especially skeptical of how some out-of-touch court might handle the case. I think it was a justified concern. And at the end of the video, your sister snapped and went off on a memorable rant that today would make such a typically placid individual like myself cringe. That video was really the first taste of any success I had, as it amassed approximately 50,000 views at the time. And I was pretty excited. I mean, what would this spell for an aspiring commentator like myself? Well, basically nothing for another year, as all my videos afterwards didn't do much. But I guess today, like Chris Martin once said, we're going back to the start, because I do find Matt Hoss a fascinating bloke. Matt Hoss's channel is known as the Matt Hoss Zone. He did used to have an Instagram, but that's gone, and he's been relatively inactive on all platforms bar the occasional appearance on Facebook where he expresses his distaste of Donald Trump and promises his inevitable return to the followers who are eagerly awaiting another masterpiece from the maestro himself. As a creator, he is fairly established, running on the platform for a few years with a fairly respectable backlog of content. His description reads, original comedy, action, horror, and fantasy short films with electronic dance music from the mind of Matt Hossein Zadeh. Hossein Zadeh being his full last name, which you know he has mercifully shortened, so I appreciate that. It's probably going to knock around 10 minutes off this video. The original comedy, action, horror, and fantasy short films were a mix of him picking up girls with his mad parkour with some vampire thrown in there. I mean, that's a simplification, but I think a lot of people tend to look at his content as Matt. There is no other way to describe his channel other than it's Matt Hoss. Unfiltered Matt Hoss. Like the room was unfiltered Tommy Wiseau, but I'm not so sure about that. This is where H3 are introduced. Most people know how the story goes, that basically Matt filed a civil action against H3 under the premise that their use of content wasn't fair and defamed his character. H3 disputed this, and this then escalated to the courts. Fortunately, this time round, the judge then, Catherine Forrest, the absolute legend, ruled in favor of the Kleins. It was probably one of the most famous motions, and it was heartwarming to see an often divided community uniting for the cause of something that transcended the different Matt Hoss, the man at the center of this lawsuit, became the sort of Disney villain of YouTube. He himself was a content creator, and thus the lawsuit felt very personal. I spoke about this in my Smosh video, but often when businesses file lawsuits, there is a lack of accountability. We'll hate the business, but they have no personality to hone in on. They have no face to lambast. Matt Hoss put himself at the front and center of the controversy, and there were very few people who were willing to defend him. He didn't set himself out there as a likable character. He often came across as highly egocentric and narcissistic, and people tended to hone in on this. People hated him for it. And when videos came out, they were very critical of Matt Hoss in the moment, but no one really asked why he did it. And in a way, when the situation is transpiring, I wouldn't expect people to. The stakes seemed very high, and theorizing over motivations when they weren't exactly relevant to the outcome seemed unnecessary. But I feel like now that time has passed and we're all on the tubes, chilling, like the fellow kids we are, I feel like maybe we do have time for a discussion because as said i really do find the character of hoss a very captivating one i think many people at the time just saw him as this delusional reactionary completely high off his own hubris and with this image in his head that he was under personal attack 
fake. And you know, when you look at the evidence, it's 100% credible and one that I even may agree with to an extent. But I want to have a discussion because I think there was a level of calculation that many people do not pay attention to. And I want to watch his videos so we can perhaps understand the mind and motivations of Matt Hoss. I'm someone who likes to find rationale and logic in everything. And although I accept that it's not always the case, it's hard to believe that in spite of these slightly blurred lines of fair use, that Matt Hoss would end up likely throwing copious amounts of money away to protect some semblance of personal reputation which he tried to reflect in his rhetoric. That makes very little sense to me, and I want to see if we can find an alternative explanation. There are a lot of details pre and post lawsuit that I think can perhaps present a case that is very different to the one we assume as truth, and I hope maybe I can provide a new take to an old situation. But to do that, we have to cut the crap and enter the Matt Hoss zone, which is a zone like no other, so I suggest we light up the fuse burn it up because at the right opinion we go hard and never go home ready set go the matt hoss character is a very interesting one and one that does seem to be pretty consistent throughout his content apart from these social commentaries which is another barrel of fish that we'll have to knock over in a bit what happens is that you have this protagonist, namely our hero, Daddy Matt here, bold guy typically, and what we see is him swooping in on this girl, the alpha male that he is. Often this girl will play hard to get, be difficult, and not comply with Hoss's obvious advances. However, you see Matt Hoss isn't easily defeated and will persist until he has the female. The first video that he has up is a video known as Flirt. He did have one up before that was called In Blood, however, it has been taken down one can assume that that was more of the horror themed content that he was looking at and flirt is much more to a formula hoss moves in girl says no matt hoss translates as yes and goes at it until she gives in to his manly charms okay this is gonna sound strange when i first saw you i got this incredible urge to pin you down and pour a gallon of boiling water down your throat. See, where me and H3 disagree is I don't think Matt Hoss is some old school cringe tuber. I think he's one of those corners of the internet that people say they've been to once and come back from and aren't really interested in checking it out a second time. It seems like it once again appeals to a select set of people who are looking to fulfill their position of being able to be able to place themselves as the protagonist and live out their dreams of picking up a girl by telling her that basically they want to bore them. That's what this is dressed up for. The thing is that on one hand this presents the delusion that many people associated Hoss with. Many people saw Hoss as someone trying to basically express himself through content in unrealistic situations. But equally this could just be a clever appeal to the audience in my opinion. Hoss makes the very interesting directorial decision to make the girl's responses fairly realistic most of the time. That rather than just to have her immediately jump on his dick, which would say to me something much more about self-gratification. Like many rational people, the subject of his video typically becomes very uncomfortable and asks him to go away continuously, insults him, seems absolutely disgusted like any reasonable person would, and yet at the end of it suddenly has this incredible epiphany and decides that actually this guy who has continuously insinuated to sexually beating you to a pulp and removing various body parts might just be the man of her dreams. Now, when he first started out, he had these sorts of art house titles such as Flirt and the highly anticipated sequel, Flirt 2. His thumbnails were pretty clickbaity and they involved the famed female, which, you know, is always a good method to attract attention. These videos were performing all right for his channel size, but it wasn't until a significant change in these videos that they began to catch fire, which was the titles. Suddenly the videos were not just Flirt or Flirt 2, they were videos that depicted occurrences in the present tense, which are always naturally more clickbaity and played off the double meaning of a quote, bold guy. These videos really picked up, often accumulating hundreds of thousands of views. Another couple details that I found interesting was how his original description read, short films from my twisted brain, and there were videos that now have been removed which looked like they didn't actually include him. Also, massive shout out to Emblazon HD. Hope that Minecraft channel takes off, mate. And so the question becomes, why did he remove those videos? I mean, it wasn't views as they seemed to be comparatively doing all right. So I suppose we could say that he wanted to make his channel more about his characters and narratively coherent. 
and I can understand why that may motivate him to remove those videos. But the videos he removed showed a difference in creativity, some sort of disconnect between the artist and the art. And that's what I find interesting. It's clear that Hoss took the decision to see Matt Hoss zone as more integral to himself as the person. But when he started it out, when he conceptualized it, he didn't look at it that way. It begs the question, how much self-awareness was actually there? Was there more self-awareness than we typically assumed? And if so, why would he present the content as lacking so much self-awareness, supposedly? Well, let's put these ideas on hold and move forward. With the removal of content that we assume he considered irrelevant to the progress of his channel, this left him with two key series, Bold Guy and Horny Tony. Bold Guy was known for his hilarity, charisma, and boldness, and Horny Tony was known, well, for his horniness. Both of these brands have serious sexual undercurrents, and it's certainly not the sort of films you'd view on primetime television. And it's quite amazing that his character hasn't been hashtag me too'd yet. Basically, it seems like content tailored for incels. The idea that somehow you can be just absolutely strange and repulsive and somehow end up with the girl. And that's what has been confusing me. Mahos writes the characters around him as completely aware of that, and yet every time he seems to end up winning the girl, sending a very very mixed message to his audience. It seems like some psychological tactic to present some very deluded part of the viewership with this unrealistic character to hold on to. I think Matt Hoss is 100% aware of his character's unlikability. However, when we make short films like Matt Hoss does, we don't expect them to be character representations of ourselves. And yet everyone assumed his characters like Bold Guy to be just that, mainly because he often seemed to aggrandize the character in a way that would somewhat represent that delusion, using words in his description such as cool and funny. Cool and funny bold guy doing epic parkour. This was your protagonist, but at the same time there was such an awareness of how transparently terrible he was, I can only think that he was trying to appeal to a set of individuals who were also that terrible and looking for some sort of creation of a fantasy where their crude behavior is actually successful. I feel Hoss was originally distant from the characters and demonstrated it through their old content, and I think this shows a different perspective from a lot of the narratives created and i want to explain in the next part why i think this has greater implications for the lawsuit yes we are being sued for copyright infringement In one of his videos about the lawsuit, Hoss says that he doesn't care about the hate. And in fact, he lives to thrive off the animosity. Despite the enemy's propaganda, I don't care about criticism or approval regarding how I conduct my business. Not only do I not care, I am proud to stand up against massive misguided opposition to fight for my rights and the rights of artists everywhere. I feel this isn't entirely true. I think on one hand, sure, he loves the attention that the whole situation gave him. But on the other hand, there was something deeply harmful about the incident that really vexed him, which is what propelled him to launch the lawsuit in the first place. I feel like many of us can agree on that. However, I think for me, the false assumption came that people assumed he launched the lawsuit because he represented himself in his characters and therefore felt he was personally under attack. After all, on one hand, I think that's where the whole defamation point of view was introduced. But personally, I think that was more of a legal tactic to try and strengthen a case which was kind of weak. By putting himself out there, exposing himself to all that negativity and then using that negativity to strengthen the persecution in his case. However, at some point, he completely filters his comments, not in a way where you would have to wait for some admin approval to post. Just 99% of the comments are gone, with a few remaining. This says to me that he might be making a return quite soon. You see, I think his content relied on a clear image being portrayed to a specific demographic. And here's the thing. It's clear that Hoss was no stranger to hate. The ratings for his videos, while he still had them enabled, painted a fairly polarizing picture. But there was clearly some sort of audience. And I'm sure many people attacked him personally 
personally in the past and some of those comments are still there so there must be something unique about the h3 video which you know you have to understand h3 to know what they can do with their brand the clients and their reaction videos have a way of impacting how certain characters are viewed by an audience the thing about bold guy is that you view his videos in the context of his arc and that creative output Ethan and Ela decontextualized his video in that sense, and they had every right to. However, they took it out of the world that Hoss wanted it to be shown in, and in my opinion, this is what concerned Hoss the most. He had an idea of how his audience were viewing his character. The fact that his appeal of his content had been swayed in a different direction was what caught his eye. Many people thought Hoss saw their portrayal as an affront to him, but I think he was concerned about the greater popular implications that followed the video for the character that he himself was not greatly invested in. You see, with their reaction video, I think what threatened Hoss above all was the implications from being memed by Ethan and Ela. The idea that the brand he created so finely was under threat. You see, there are huge implications from being memed. Not only does it completely shift a public perception of something that you may be taking seriously, but if you can't transcend the meme, then you know you're running on borrowed time. Memes become boring. If you cannot redefine yourself there, then you will get lost in the vault. Many people are under the impression that the Ethan and Ela situation was the first time that he tried to silence someone over such pretenses. But in fact, I reached out to one of the actresses in his video who was under a similar predicament, Anika Reitman. She told me that Hoss had refused to let her use any of the content, not even for an acting reel, despite the fact that she testified that they had collaborated heavily on each part of the process and it was part of the agreement for her participation. She tried to upload this acting reel onto her channel and he had her channel suspended and even threatened to take her to court. Sounds eerily similar, doesn't it? She even posted a comment on the video five years ago, well before the H3 situation. On top of this, she also said how although she found Matt to be a fairly unpleasant person, he wasn't the awkward quirk that he often depicted in his work, and that there was a degree of separation from himself and the character in the presentation, although not in their goal, as Matt was quick to offer to take her out after shooting. On top of this, Anika also believed the character that Hoss created was made to appeal to a demographic, a very specific one that she herself claimed to receive flack from. I believe that with this knowledge, we can apply and create a theory that suggests Matt was quite aware of the sort of content that he was making and upon realizing the potential sought to protect its image at all costs whether it was attacking larger youtubers or even the people who worked with him and actually gave him their time so we bring this back to Ethan and Ela's content. What it did was basically turn Hoss's video into a bit of a joke. And that annoyed him. We can all agree on that. But in my opinion, he wasn't annoyed because it personally insulted him, but because it put his content into a box where its shelf life had been cut criminally short. In my opinion, he wanted these videos to do well for the right reasons. And he knew that when Ethan and Ela uploaded their video, those reasons were evaporating rather quickly. In the tone of what he created following the filing of the lawsuit, it almost portrayed this guy who was deeply insecure in what he was creating and someone who viewed themselves as under attack when really the lawsuit in my opinion was a tactical move i think he was completely aware of his character but he knew there was a demographic for it. The thing is, the internet brings together those sorts of people. Matt wanted to create a world where the creepy, awkward weirdo wins the girl. And when Ethan and Ela ran a very different narrative, he knew that the brand was on borrowed time, that he'd become some kind of ironic joke. So here we are, we have H3 creating a mockery out of the content that you love, and Hoss, legally speaking, is up against it. In a way, you know, fair use is considered to be a prevailing thing. And H3 isn't your everyday creator. You can't just strike down the channel without anyone noticing. So he had to stop H3 or perhaps sacrifice everything that he had worked for, from his perspective, at least. And this is where we address the lawsuits. The lawsuit itself was handled very interestingly by Hoss. See, he went in with an offer which included the clause that they never talk about him again, and he asked for the total of $3,750, which you know, although is substantial money, in my opinion, Hoss considered that amount to be the sort of money that H3 might compromise on, and the money itself was probably for damage to what he considered to be his brand's reputation. Another point that I believe helps with the additional compromise that he offered as shown in H3's clip here. He says, okay, listen, you don't have to pay us the money. You don't have to accept guilt. All you need to do 
is make a video on your main channel promoting Bold Guy, talking about how you respect him as a creator, apologizing for using too much of his content, post on all of your social medias for two, for months, two months. For two months, underline for two months. We counted it, guys. Two months is legit. We need two months from you. Okay, can we get two months? Can we get two months from you? And share a few of his other yeah, videos. Share several of his videos. Yeah. He clearly went into this under the impression that it wouldn't have to be taken to court. H3 made the point that setting the standards was the concern, but Hoss himself wasn't interested in that. He was interested in preservation. Ethan and Ela said that they had already promoted his content, and that was true. But that's the thing, they had promoted it in a way that had contradicted what it stood for. Ethan and Ela, when they were watching that content, and many viewers assumed that it was just some guy doing wacky parkour out in his own little world. But what they'd actually done was publicize content that had very different intentions for what they had interpreted it as. However, this message that I personally think Hoss promoted in the videos about the creepy guy getting the girl, although seemingly obvious, was often one that was somewhat subliminal, and its appeal to the audience relied on them not outwardly acknowledging their interests ones that are rather twisted, and therefore having a pair of comedians explicitly interpret it in a completely different way undermine that slight message that Hoss was trying to push, and therefore by retaining the serious credibility of his content in a promotion by H3 that would have been very different to their original video, he would have been able to continue making what he wanted to, rather than being a laughing stock. With that said, if H3 had made that promotional video, I think it would have been rather embarrassing for Hoss given the response and I think he misinterpreted how people may have responded to that. You see, many people see Hoss as a reactionary who lashed out. And make no mistake, he probably has that side to him, but at the same time, the lawsuit itself was very calculated and clearly represented what he thought was a threat to his own content and interpretation. Now, as mentioned earlier, Hoss was the face of the lawsuit, and that's a real difference. When he realized that this probably wasn't going to be resolved in the initial stage, he switched game plan. One very interesting incident was this one, as documented by Ethan and Ela. Also worth mentioning that was particularly obnoxious is that while we were in negotiations for everything, that one night when he was just real angry and bitter, he, on our private video that was already removed, I guess he still had the URL, yeah. and he did a strike, he did a takedown on our video when we were in good faith negotiations just because he wanted to help us. However, I personally find it rather implausible that Hoss just flew into some spontaneous rage and struck the video. I much more find it plausible that he did that with the intention to provoke backlash onto himself so that he would subsequently receive hate from Angry H3 fans, which he would then use to fuel his case firstly in his own content, and subsequently as reflected in the lawsuit itself. I'm impressed. If you look at the numbers, those are two very successful hashtags. You did misspell my name on one of them though, but I could hurt you when they search for the hashtag. Hoss was completely aware of the court's ignorance of most of the internet culture, and I think he realized that if he could paint himself to be a victim of harassment convincingly enough, he would be able to prove a point that his character had been defamed, as by proof he was receiving so much hate, and by documenting the success of the comments and their vitriol, he could then use them as a case going forward. Hoss was always up against it, and I think he knew that, but I feel like he didn't want to back down that he wanted to keep on that notion that he always wins, the fact that he always got the girl. And therefore, by striking the video, a seemingly inconsequential act, he had it documented and riled up the people, H3 included. He was prepared for that hate and he used it to his advantage. He followed the extreme hate comment video up with another video specifically addressing the situation and branding basically everyone who was against him as liars. He knew people hated him. But equally, he knew that the courts wouldn't really care about his reputation. Hoss saw this as an all or nothing moment. Either he ends up being the walking parkour meme that H3 made him out to be and be confined within that narrative or end their careers and scare away future commentators. With that said, I think he really passed the point of no return after initiating the lawsuit and who knows how the public would have responded if he'd won the case. But either way, he wanted to finish what he started. You see, this is where Hoss welded the ideas of the character and himself together, overtly for the first time. So when he was attacked, he turned it into this personal issue and thus used the attacks against him as evidence. He suddenly switched to commentary content, which is naturally more personal and tried to walk this very weird line of connecting his on-screen persona with his personality. The one I'm voting for is Jill Stein of the Green Party. 
I mean, come on, if you're a straight male or a lesbian and you're looking for a gilf, Jill's the one you want. Even in ways that made very little sense and didn't link up to how other people had viewed him before. H3 themselves, despite understanding the difference between fiction and reality, as expressed in many videos such as their recent one on Seinfeld, decided by assumption that Bold Guy's personality represented Matt Hoss. But it didn't necessarily. Bold Guy just represented a character from a film a short film from the twisted mind. What you'll find interesting now is how, in spite of loving the hate at the time, Hoss has now removed basically all comments and is clearly very carefully vetting the sections on how he is presented, particularly on his newer videos. They all have exceptionally low numbers of comments and Hoss hasn't actually put an approval filter on it. No, he just removed 99% of comments. I know this because I tested it by leaving a comment and it immediately went up and he then favorited it. Cheers, Matt. He's clearly very eager to move forward with his channel and distance himself from the image portrayed by H3's content. And in my opinion, the hanging legacy over it all is the reason why he's probably delayed uploading again. This mattered much more than just a personal affront that Hoss lashed out again. In my opinion, Hoss is a calculated individual. From the first days of his content, he blatantly changed it to create a brand identifiable with a certain demographic and to appeal to a specific audience through that very specific branding. Something that the sporadic online personality that people often framed him as wouldn't do. If he was a Tommy Wiseau, oh, hi, Mark. like fully in that sense, he wouldn't have necessarily cared whether that content was marketable or not. But he did. He always set up a very specific character arc and not one that necessarily reflected him as a person. The threat H3 posed was not that it threatened the perception of him as a person, because although he certainly is a character, Bold Guy was not Matt Hoss. No, it was because it threatened the perception of his brand, one that he had fine-tuned to cast to a particular group of people, in my opinion, perhaps incels even, and his response was not one of reflex, but one that would seek to preserve that established reputation as much as possible, which unfortunately for him, H3 called him out on, publicized the incident further, and likely push that reputation over the edge. But even at that point, it didn't stop him from trying a few tricks and making it look like a personal attack by changing up his content and integrating it very uncomfortably. Unfortunately, these tactics were futile when it came down to the matter of law. Whether he'll be able to bring back that audience with all this legacy hanging over him is another question. But I believe he's a bit more grounded than people think and underestimating people's calculated nature is something we should never do. Matt Hoss is a shark in the water waiting to strike. I feel that maybe during the situation, people were paying more attention to that. This isn't to say I think Matt Hoss is a genius, far from it, but I find the portrayal of him as this some sort of clumsy and reactionary villain, one that is a bit inaccurate. Reflected in the lawsuit, I see it as much more of a calculated power play, one where he wanted to show himself as the guy who wins in the end and to impress that sect of audience who admired him, the people who wanted him to win to show that he is the guy who gets the girl at the end of the day, and yet he failed, perhaps undermining his whole reputation. I mean, can you see him doing political commentary? And that's where Republicans and Democrats are, two different flavors of the same thing. What we need is at least a third option, like a pineapple. Ah, oh, neat. Just don't put that on a pizza, bastards. So that was the video. A lot of hard work into this one. Uh, love to hear your thoughts on it. Matt Hoss's motivations are really unclear. And honestly, the aim of this video was just to prevent an alternative perspective. It's not one that I necessarily think is correct, but I thought it was a really interesting angle to take it. And I would love to hear what people think about his motivations in the comments below. On top of that, I want to give a big shout out to the editors. They have done a fantastic job. I'm going to leave their links in the pinned comment. Go and check them out. Also, a big shout out to my Patreons. Some of them on screen right now. Lovely, lovely people. Thank you so much. And a special thanks to Ryan, you beautiful man. You are insane. I don't know why you do it, but you do it for me, and that's what matters. As an extra here, I have to give a shout out to Connor for his $50 donation to my Patreon. Once again, incredibly generous. I really appreciate it, my friend. I really appreciate it. My throat is still dying.
If you want to speak to me about this, Twitter, at The Right Opinion, Facebook, Discord, they work too. You know, whatever tickles your fancy. I don't really have too much else to say. I'm pretty knackered as it is, but I hope you enjoyed the video. And I hope it provided something a bit more spicy because I wanted to do something a bit more different this time. And it was, it was a hard one. It was a hard theory to put forward, especially when you're dealing with a lot of hypotheticals. But something about Matt Hoss always did just kind of throw me off about his character presentations, which I think present an ulterior motivation. But we can have that discussion another time. Until then, I'm The Right Opinion, and I will see you in the next one.